Um, so those are the big things, but mostly A's and B's. But the big thing is, for the documents, you have to directly relate them to outside information. And I put my quick outline up, and I have a lot of good information here. Here's the thing. If you're going to talk about fear of the Soviets, it's not enough to say they feared the Soviets. You have to mention they promised free elections in Eastern Europe and didn't do it, and so now they're fearful of occupation zones in Japan. So Churchill, Eisenhower, uh, Schwillard, all say they're fear of the Soviets. It's your job to add a little bit more. And that was the biggest issue. But most people understood the documents. Most people got most of the documents. One thing sometimes some people summarize and just start explaining what's in the document, not really relating it to your thesis statement. But here's my example, and I put this up here to give you a good thesis statement. And this is actually one that I, I'm not saying about exactly written correctly, because I did it really fast. But the point is, it fits in exactly the way, the best way to approach this essay. Despite the fear of an American invasion, the fear of an American invasion of the Japanese mainland, the U.S. dropped two atomic bombs of force and already militarily defeated Japan to unconditionally surrender and to diplomatically intimidate the Soviets before the end of the Pacific War. And the reason I did it that way, so I can have one paragraph to talk about how hard the Japanese fought, one paragraph to talk about how close they were to surrender, and one paragraph to talk about the Soviets. And then here, uh, the documents, I wasn't sure if I'd use this one. The only thing I did not put down is I totally forgot to put down half. Truman believed he wanted to justify dropping the atomic or Truman, um, Truman, um, Wanted or talked about Japan was willingness to keep fighting to the end because he wanted to justify the atomic bomb for half. Next thing, as luck would have it, on I posted this today. There are two files. Sometimes the Google Drive doesn't work all the time. Sometimes the <laughs> Teams doesn't work. So I give you both of them because I care about you. On this are going to be DBQ samples. And materials from this last DBQ we took. I posted it today online, so it is on there. Why isn't this posted? Ugh. Just imagine it's posted. I have to go do another line. But you click that. Sorry, it's one of the fun things about trying to do two different screens, and I'm trying to be in front of class. And I have no idea what this comes up. But if you hit that, it gives you all these sample documents. And then I have, you know, the guidelines how to write DBQ. But the thing I really like are two that I took from previous essays, and I put it in such a way that you're going to read them very nicely. These are sample DBQs. So I went back and I typed them out so you can look at them. So here's sample context, here's good thesis statements. And here are two sample paragraphs. I posted that for you to give you another look. Just want to go back through because hey, remember, you got to do it on Thursday. You're going to need a DBQ on Thursday. I don't know what it's going to be on. The question is going to be anything from the Revolutionary War to the 1960s. Yeah. How many essays are on? Two. Then one regular essay. How much time do we have? Four hours. So all that is there. So on your own time, look at it, and I'll come back and talk about it again. And I will talk about it again tonight because I'm doing a review session tonight. Seven o'clock. And I will record it. And if we, you know, if, I, if there appears to be enough people using this, I will do it again. There's the link to it. It is on, I posted it on Teams, but it's also in Team AP US History, and it should be also on your calendar, but there's the link. And I'm going to do it again if enough people want to do it. My tentative plans are for Sunday. All right, and so I'll talk a little bit more about the regular essay, but I'm not as worried about that because I've seen the way you write short IDs, and I'm not that worried. Because the thing about a regular essay 
Each paragraph is a short ID to a tab. You just add a topic sentence and that's all it is. And you have done that, and I'm not that worried. Okay, did everyone grab one of these and now you have to pick them up outside of class? But there are a couple things I did. Um, first off, just practice test. It's just the one they, they gave out in 2016. And 55 questions. Uh, I would like this stuff by Thursday or Friday. Same deal. Give yourself about, they have the time limits on there, but you know, 55 minutes. If you can get this done in about 45, that would be awesome. Because that would be the time to go back and check. Don't overthink it. If you're not sure, go with your best, your best in, uh, initial instinct. It's so easy, and we've all done this. You can start overthinking and change questions. Everyone has done that, right? Is that pleasant feeling too when you change when you know it, right? If you're not sure, move on. Come back. Yeah. Will there be a multiple choice section on the actual exam? 55 questions. Okay. This is for this, and this is the way they, they give you a little stimulus, which in a way I like. Just get you to think about it. It'll give you a little document to think back at the era. It isn't necessarily a question about looking the document, it's a question about the era. Next, tomorrow we're going to watch a video. I'll post it, I'll watch it, but we're going to watch it. It's called The Rating Within. And it's the best single thing out of the civil rights era. It's by far the best. And so I have a worksheet with it. That's what we're doing. We'll do it online. I'll post it on Wednesday. In fact, I'll be in here. We'll be at home. I'm excited. Next, this is a very good little study thing I've been doing for a while. So I'll just give it a little bit more in a week. It has every unit, and it has key topics from that unit. And this gives you two things, two reasons why I like it. First off, if you go through all these topics on your own, and you can pick up about 10 things, brainstorm things, people, events, places, facts that come up, facts about that era. So for example, you know, uh, we look down at the bottom and have sectionalism, the crisis of the union in the Civil War. That's a pretty broad topic. But if you can come up with things like Camps, Nebraska, Red Scott decision, which by the way, me saying that will better be familiar. But uh, compromise of 1850, the election of Abraham Lincoln. If you can come up with about 10 things, you're ready in that era. You're going to be in pretty good shape. If you come up with one, now you know the era to go back and review. And yes, there'll be some duplicate. And there's also one more thing. Opening paragraph of your essay, you need two to three sentences of context. These are contexts. If the question is about uh, industrial revolution, the stuff that happened around it is your context. So that will help you with context. It's a good study guide. It's just a good thing to go back and just review on your own. Think of things. Okay, all right. I can't think of it. Oh, after 1980, just as long as you know what it is, you're okay. Don't worry so much about the grammar. After 1980, you just have to know the basics. All right? So let's go and go finish this up and move on. And did we get to this? We got right to here, right? Yeah. So Joe one, the Soviets exploded an atomic bomb. They didn't expect the Soviets to do this. Totally took them by surprise. And by the way, that means now that that's the picture of the Soviet got bomb. And that means now that the United States, for the first time, to least their point of view, is directly threatened on their mainland. That's where you start getting the civil defense and telling kids to they can duck under their desk in case of an atomic war, they'll be perfectly fine, which is insanity. But I I remember these kind of things. The survival of new nuclear attack and how to dig a trench in your backyard for the draw over and sit there for two weeks. that up. And I remember telling my, my dad, we should probably dig a trench back there in case there's nuclear war. And he said, no, that's fantasy. Don't even don't think about it. Don't worry about it. You missed that part. Maybe I'll come back for you guys. The when there's a silent moment, you think, is that is that it? Are we done? Did the bombs just drop? Ah, the Cold War fun. But how the Soviets get it? Spies. They really did have spies. There were a number of spies in Los Alamos. Most famously was Klaus Fuchs. Be careful spelling that. Klaus Fuchs was a Bulgarian scientist who fled to England, 
fled fascism, and then was farmed out by the British to work in Los Alamos. But the British did basically, they said, okay, we'll farm you out, then after the war, then come back and work on the British farm. Well, the U.S. had broken the Soviet wartime code after the war and found out that, yeah, he was a spy. He sent the exact designs of the implosion bomb back to Russia. Sent him back. And with that, this confirmed many of the greatest fears. By the way, Britain was really embarrassed. They arrested him, and the trial took about four hours to try him for espionage. He, since he, he's the worst type of spy. He didn't do it for money. He did it because he sincerely was so scared about fascism, he thought the only way to stop fascism was Stalin having a bomb. You know, spies would do it for money. You could give, you could build them. You just give them more money, you can turn them. Those who really believe that they're doing the right thing, they're the ones that are, can, can be the most dangerous. Even more dangerous if he's right. But this led to a massive wave of spy hunting, most famously, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg were arrested for espionage. As it turned out, Julius Rosenberg probably did commit espionage, but in the Cold War panic and fear after the Soviets got a bomb, these two would be executed the first time in peacetime history for espionage, and there was no concrete evidence that Ethel Rosenberg had anything to do with it. This should give you an idea how just absolutely mad it got. It got Cold War madness. And the hunt for spies went everywhere. And just two months later, an even bigger shock hit. Oh, almost forgot. So this led to this idea that there's an enemy within. And don't forget that element of Cold War, that you're always looking for an enemy within. The United States had just passed the National Security Act, the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, there's a growing shadow government, and then there were spies. And the problem is, they look like everybody else. Okay, not quite. Not everybody out of mustache like that. And the next, even bigger shock, the communists won the Chinese Civil War. In the Chinese Civil War, there were two basic sides, even though it's a little more complex than this. The so-called nationalists, actually the former socialists, but the nationalists uh, were under a man by the name of Chiang Kai-shek. And there's Chiang Kai-shek on the cover of the The U.S. gave him all these weapons during World War II, he fought the Japanese, but with mixed results. And then the communist leader, Mao Zedong, right here. And Mao was the real thing, a guerrilla fighter, successful organizer of the fight against the nationalists and the Japanese, very good at propaganda. Well, the U.S. had been pumping millions of dollars into Chiang Kai-shek. He even got the seat on the Security Council. But then, shockingly fast in 1949, the communists won. In fact, the only way to describe it was a complete shock. The nationalists, do I have it right here? Yeah, the nationalists just collapsed. We literally just overnight collapsed. They outnumbered the communists nearly 10 to 1 in the military. But their army collapsed, and literally within two to three months, in the fall and the summer of, or fall, summer fall of 1949, the nationalists fled. And Chiang Kai-shek barely fled with his life. I mean, just barely made it out. Now, Truman had grown tired of the corruption of, the, of, Mao's, or of, the, of Chiang Kai-shek. But now we're stuck with it. Chiang Kai-shek fled to a former Japanese colony called Formosa, which today everyone calls Taiwan. And that became good China. And then the People's Republic of China, AKA at this time, everybody in the US called it Red China, would be the mortal enemy. And they would become the bad Chinese. And there are two Chinas. And there still are two Chinas. The United States did not recognize the largest country in the world as a country until 1979. We recognize China, what everyone calls Taiwan. And then in 1979, in the middle of the night, we switched. Partially to open up economic ties to the biggest country in the world. Now the United States recognizes the People's Republic of China, and the US does not recognize Taiwan as a country. 
So Taiwan does not have a seat in the UN. Taiwan, the US doesn't have an embassy. It's officially not a country. No one recognizes it. Because China would just go nuts. China is kind of once again threatening to invade Taiwan. And it's a, if, whenever, if anybody says we're going to recognize uh, Taiwan as a country, the People's Republic just goes insane and threatens to to this day. But then they have their seat on the Security Council. So the People's Republic of China weren't even in the UN until 1979. It's pretty remarkable. Well, here's the thing. Remember the Truman Doctrine? If China falls, doesn't it seem like we're really vulnerable now, all the way to Wyoming? And the cry went out in the United States, who lost China? Because that means a big victory for Stalin. And according to Truman Doctrine thinking, every communist is the same. So this is a check off for the big victory for Stalin. As it turned out, they hated each other and were major rivals. And 20 years after this, the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China would fight two major battles on the Manchurian Soviet border. And if they're killing each other, that's a sign that maybe they're not so close allies. But at the time, it appeared like the communists are winning everywhere. And the cry went out in the United States who lost China? It must have been the US government, aka Truman. The Truman and the De Truman and the Democrats were soft on communists, and this became a big de domestic politics political issue. No politician wanted to be accused of being soft on communism. So in domestic politics, nobody wanted to be accused of. By the way, this is where he said a thousand locusts will come out, spreading communism everywhere. No, that's not what happened. China has its own very particular political issues why they fell to communism. But no politician wants to be accused of losing this. So Truman, going to 1950, he's sitting there thinking, I'm not going to be called soft again. And every Democrat is going to say, I'm not going to be soft again. Now, could have Truman saved China somehow from communist revolt? Absolutely not. It's patently ridiculous. But they, in the US, Republican blamed Truman. And Truman and the Democrats fell right into it. So, the National Security Act, printed out the National Security Act, would write a document, actually it's just the 68 document, secret document, but it would have long lasting impact to this day. It was shockingly alarmist. Oh my God, we we're about ready to follow the communists after China fell. No, the US was the strongest country in the world, but everybody was just freaking out. And they said, we must have a massive military buildup. And this was already kind of happening, but now it's like, we have to. And Truman got terrified. If we don't start building up the military, I'll get accused of being soft on communists. Democrats will get accused. And that is why today we have the biggest military in the world. It starts here. Oh, we'll be scared of, of being soft on communists. Yeah. National Security Council. Remember, that was created out of the National Security Act. That's a good time to come. So, with that, a wave of anti communist activity began in the US. The House of American Activities Committee, QAC, had been created back in the 1930s to look for communists. And now domestic politics came where who is going to be the strongest looking for communists? And they began to investigate people looking for communists. At first it was fascists, but now they're looking for communists. And this was a way for Republicans to attack Democrats. So Democrats control the House, but Republicans on QAC can bring up people and say, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And all they had to do is accuse somebody and their entire career could be ruined. And they focused on areas 
where they knew that um, there was some activity, maybe of fellow travelers, Hollywood. They went after actors and producers and say that decadent media was leading us to the road of communism. And by the way, that has not changed to this day. It's a very good, easy way to tap your point up and say, it's the media. Look at the media. They are so whatever you want to say they are. Usually it would be a liberal, but here's, for example, at Hewak, some of the more famous actors and actors in the world, that's Lauren Bacall, Humphrey Bogart, uh, oh my God, I can't remember his name, Tommy Kay. And anybody would be accused of being a communist in Hollywood being put on a blacklist. And there were hundreds of actors, producers, directors who did not work for the rest of the decade. All they had to do is accuse somebody for being a, a communist. But that is going to lead to the most violent strain of anti-communism. And this is just going to be three months after, three months after the Red Scare. In fact, I'm going to play you just a little bit of a, uh, uh, a video on this. So let me change something really quick. Just a few minutes and then I'll finish it up. Okay, here we go. So McCarthyism. And this was basically McCarthy who would just make rampant accusations and it was a way to attack Democrats. He was a Republican senator from Wisconsin. So we're gonna watch just a little bit of this video. Please work. Men throughout the world learn to look on the brutal. The communist menace was supported. Of exercise law. Losses of one kind or another. One communist among the American advisors at Yalta was one communist too many. Joseph R. McCarthy liked to call himself Tail Gunner Joe, although he had only sat behind a tail gun as a publicity stunt. For four brutal years, the junior senator from Wisconsin reigned as the country's self-appointed commie hunter supreme. Joe McCarthy was uh, black-jowled, scowling, uh, kind of sinister-looking person with a five o'clock shadow. Uh, lumbering gait, and yet those who got to know him found him to be gregarious. He had the sort of the appeal of a tramp dog wagging its tail. Joe McCarthy had little to show for his first four years in Washington. A group of newspaper correspondents named him the worst member of the United States Senate. That's saying a lot. With re-election approaching, he was a candidate desperate for an issue. On February 9th, 1950, McCarthy arrived in Wheeling, West Virginia. So, February 1950, McCar McCarthy arrived in Wheeling, West Virginia. That's three months after the communists won in China. Five months, or four and a half months after Joe won. He arrived there. There's fear of communists everywhere, just literally exploding, and... ...to give a Lincoln Day speech to the local Republican Women's Club. He told his audience that there were 205 communists in the State Department controlling American foreign policy. It was a blatant lie. So, the everyone catch that? That's what McCarthy did. McCarthy said there are 205 communists in the State Department, <laughs> and they're controlling American policy. In fact, he held up a piece of paper and said, in my hand, I have a list. Just purely made up. Purely made up. In fact, he was a zero. It was not planned. It just kind of happened. But it's fun. Willard Edwards of the Chicago Tribune later said it was really a throwaway because if McCarthy had thought it was a, going to be a big speech, A, he wouldn't have given it in, we, in Wheeling, West Virginia, and B, he would have brought a bunch of reporters down who were bright-wing reporters who were pals of his. So uh, it, was, uh, it was really a throwaway, but there it was, the charge. A charge. 
The senator's accusations were published by newspapers across the country. McCarthy, elated by the attention, continued his speaking tour in Reno, Nevada, where Frank McCulloch, a young reporter for the Reno Gazette, was sent to meet him. Mother came down off the plane, made clear that he'd known us for 50 years. We walked away from the plane with his arms around both our shoulders. We walked down a Reno street, with, again, with his arm about our shoulders. And he discovered in the process of that walk that I'd been a Marine, and that delighted him, and we became even closer buddies. Instinctively, socially, for a U.S. senator to treat a, a Bush League reporter like that is, is, is not, it isn't within the framework, and it, it made me very uneasy. McCarthy was as easy with journalists as he was loose with the truth. In a subsequent radio interview, the number of communists in the State Department dwindled from 205 to 57. He totally forgot. We had uh, the message from AP in which I think they quoted him as saying that he had in his hand a list of 205, and the story said communists, flatly, unequivocally. We began to try to examine him about, uh, or question him, about why did you say 205 before and 57 now? I'll be honest with you, I don't remember what the answer was. It was a long argument, and we didn't get anywhere with it. And finally, it got to the point where, at the end, we were challenged and produced this list of 57. Well, uh, we went through a great routine. He looked through his pockets. He looked through, he looked in his briefcase, and he finally pronounced he'd lost it. I remember when... So, supposedly, that piece of paper he showed in West Virginia was a bookie sheet to bet on horse racing. He just grabbed something. But once it got out there, people are like, they must be communists. They're spies. They got to be everywhere. And then McCarthy is like, got it. And just started making accusations on everybody. And let me fast forward just a little bit further where I take it. Maybe. To Joe McCarthy, hunting communists was little more than a game. Yeah. A game in which he was the big winner. Around Washington, rumors of his drinking and gambling went unreported. I don't think this is an exaggeration. I think in probably, certainly no more than an hour, maybe an hour and a half, we had eight drinks, eight or nine drinks. I could hardly get up from the table. And then everybody drank the same. All three of us drank bourbon and soda. And uh, we all drank the same thing. I can't remember who paid the bill either. I suspect we did, but I don't remember. <laughs> the press of the day had one weakness that Joe McCarthy understood all too well. Their standards required them to be objective, to report exactly what was said, even if it was unsubstantiated. He understood also another, maybe more important point, that denials are never as dramatic as charges, and they're always 24 to 48 hours behind. The consequence was day after day, week after week, into the years, that the charges were A1, the denials were B7. And he understood that, and he played it to the hill. I remember Mac that McCarthy. Okay, I'm gonna pass. For, okay, I'm gonna go over there. But the whole thing about McCarthy is if you make an accusation, it sticks, even if it's a blatant lie. So what McCarthy did, it was a way to attack people, and all it took was an accusation, and they were destroyed. And soon everybody was just terrified of an accusation from McCarthy. And who supported him? Make sure you get this down. It's the Republicans. The Republicans supported him, backed him up gave him support, gave him some, um, because he's attacking the Democrats. Remember what I told you after 48? Truman won. So I'll give you the credit. Truman won. And so now the gloves are off. We're going to attack. And so this get, began four years of this. Now, it was kind of a bully. Now, what would kill McCarthy? McCarthy was very effective attacking the Democrats until... A Republican was elected president in 52, Eisenhower. And McCarthy wasn't smart enough to quit. He kept attacking Eisenhower. He thought, well, I'm just going to attack whoever in charge. And so McCarthyism ended up dying when he quit attacking the Republican president. And he started making up wild accusations that Eisenhower was a communist and a traitor. And this destroyed McCarthy's. Uh, credibility. He'd eventually be censored, and he would die in 1957. His liver literally exploded. He was drinking between two, one and two fifths of whiskey a day. 
just an absolute alcoholic. Now, the Red Scare would go on until the 19, until 1990. I mean, this would still go on, and if anybody could be accused. But McCarthyism was the worst strain of it. So, so naturally, we had to look for communists everywhere, even in bumper cars. Which was great. So, as you can see from this lovable picture, children had bikes. I mean, this is the time it was here in the 1950s. And this could only mean one thing. It's time to write a thesis statement. Everybody, in your margins, quick write a thesis statement. So, you got a couple minutes. Give me give the main example of the question. Take a good, solid position on why. So something to tie your blueprint together. And then a blueprint. Three topics. That would be the topics for your paragraphs, a.k.a. your paragraphs. It will be basically a short idea on that. You got two minutes. Go. What was the biggest policy change that happened after 47 and on? The biggest policy change. And then how did that change? What came out of all this? Watch out. Okay, go back and look at your thesis. Make sure that you address the question. Make sure you have a why, a purpose. Something very basic that ties your entire essay together. And then three good topics that you can write a short idea on. A topic sentence, explain what it is and how it relates to your thesis, give a couple of examples, you got a good paragraph. You know, six to seven sentences for an essay. A little bit longer, short IDs. You need a couple examples. Hector. Doctrines. Acts. Carpy. Collections. There's all kinds of stuff. Okay, we're done. And if you look at that, and you have a good blueprint, you've organized your essay. So think about first paragraph, second paragraph, third paragraph. All right, so let's look at a blueprint. What are some of the examples we gave? Some of the things that showed up that you would write a paragraph about that being your blueprint. Let's give me one, Alex, give me one. Yeah, so national security, national security, and that would be national security act. You really go on that. I mean, that's a huge one. Talk about CIA, the NSA, uh, shadow government. Is there another one? Yes. Truman Doctrine is the biggest thing that happened in that era. Maybe one of the biggest foreign policy moves in the history of the United States. And that's really, that's one of those things I'm not, not hyperbole. Well, yeah, I about it. Any other ones? So we did talk about Turkey, Greece. Defense spending, 
uh, containment, domino effect. Is there another one? This is domestic politics. What else just happened? We just saw something about that. Yeah, McCarthyism and HUAC. Is there another one? Was there an election? Yeah, the election of 1948. Is there another one? Hmm? Yeah. Because then who lost China? And it's, no, we can't be soft on communism. And if you do that, that's your three paragraphs. You come up with that. And that's why, think about three, to get a couple of examples of each. So here's the one I wrote up real quick. You know, up to the Marshall Plan, uh, Berlin, I was thinking like NATO, things like that. McCarthyism. National National Security Act, National Security Act. I didn't even put down the Truman Doctrine. Look at that. I didn't have Truman Doctrine. <laughs> oh, Truman Doctrine, okay. I did have the word Truman Doctrine. But now it's on my blueprint. But the only time I would talk about like containment and that kind of thing. All right. Would that be a good question to give? I think we could see one in the Cold War. Don't, don't throw Mr. Parker's in the Cold War while studying nothing else. No, don't do that. I quit guessing. About 15 years ago, I guessed the DBQ exactly three years in a row. And I thought I was clear one. I thought I had it. And then, I, then they did like the things on the events leading up to the Revolutionary War four years in a row. It's crazy. And I could guess it. Yeah. How are the different sections of the AP exam weighted? Like, how, how much does the DBQ affect your overall score? Yeah, your multiple choice is about 25. Uh, or, about 30 percent of your score dbq is about 25 the essay is about 15 and the short answer question is about 15. so multiple choice are the highest in DBQ. short answer question is a good way to pick up things remember that's about nine three sentence short ideas so let's do a couple more things in because amazing things happen after the united states became mccarthyism to shock there's a loyalty oath craze where everyone started to get loyalty oath to prove you're loyal to the country. Uh, it, it got a little bit like uh, wearing a flag lapel pins in the early 2000s. And, but it would explode. All of these fears would happen in the Korean War, 1950 to 1953. After World War II, they divided it up in North and South. Just basically just put a line. Korea had been a, a a Japanese colony for 40 years. Uh, they horrifically treated Korea. And there's been a Soviet occupation zone and the US occupation zone. But just like Germany, they remained disunified in 49, they created two countries. In the North, Kim Il sung, whose great grandson is still the dictator. So it's got this hereditary totalitarian dictatorship in North Korea. And he was a hard bitten uh, fighter, communist guerrilla. He had been fighting the North Koreans. He had trained in the Soviet Union. He had fought with Mao. And in the South, a man by the name of Sigmund Rhee. And Sigmund Rhee was anti-Japanese, a dictator, not a dictator of US support. He was the real deal. He was not popular at all. He had not spent much time in Korea at all. He'd been exiled. They had a real army. They had a hundred tanks. South Korea and the US left with almost nothing. Just never even dreamed about this. And when the invasion happened, it was an absolute shock. An absolute shock. June 25th, 1950, the North attacked and took South Korea totally by surprise. Seoul, the capital of South Korea, you notice is just right below the border, which then was the 38th parallel. And Seoul was fell really fast. It uh, South Korea could not stop the, the North Korean tanks, and they advanced very quickly, and this caused absolute panic. You can imagine the point of view in the White House. When they found out about this, like, oh, God, now we're going to be accused of losing Korea, even though most Americans could not have found Korea on the map. But, oh, my God, Korea's going to fall. What's next? Well, they like to say it pointed like an arrow into Japan. Japan, which is now just forming their own democracy after World War II, they'll fall, and then what's next? Wyoming. So Truman felt he had no choice but to enter the war. Does anybody else have their thank you? Does anybody else have their thank you? 
Oh, because you didn't have that. How'd you do? Well, oh, how did you do us? Okay. Okay. <laughs> This one? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Can this all turn around? Yeah, I want to. Do you have anybody? Okay, we got yours. That looks good. And hopefully, when you go back and look at them, you'll be like, oh, I see what I missed. I hope we're at least a few of them. I know not everyone. Okay, we need more outside information. Because what happens on this is you have to do some of this. So you have to directly relate to what you know about this. So you must, I can't remember this. I can't remember this. But you must have the time to get this. And not really over there. But I find it really nice. But so that's why I didn't get it all in one month or two. And I find it sad. And I find it sad. This is really good. Yeah. No. I know. I know. I know. I know. Okay, I'm about to pick it up for you. I'm going to the Philadelphia. Yeah, really? Yeah. Okay, let me hold on to it. Let me, uh, find it. I'm to see if you had a lot of You were really good. Yeah, I just didn't know. I didn't know. I just wanted to be my loop. Yeah. Blue? So you, I think you need Yeah, I didn't have like a Y or the top. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I usually do alright on the but I guess that one I don't know. But you're right there. I mean, you're yeah. I mean, just get a little bit of pieces and I'll probably all about it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That makes you mad all the twists you want to do that. I will, yeah. It's not a jerk.
That one I can't help with. I just gotta 